companies and uh, the promoters from an exit and the investors, more importantly, from an exit standpoint, there is uh, definitely a, a, a lot of buzz. The second thing is that Freshworks, which went IPO on NASDAQ, is also a great uh, story in terms of what you are looking at today. Overall, uh, from a US standpoint, uh, for the India companies, where what we call as a flip structure is taking place, and many of these SaaS-based uh, uh, plays or B2B plays, which is more uh, you know, technology-focused and more deep tech, what, as, a, as we call them, they all hopefully will have an exit uh, outside of India. And then, uh, you know, there are, uh, again, two school of thoughts there when an investment comes in India. For example, Flipkart, when they did a deal, Flipkart is a Singapore headquartered company, but predominantly an India company, as we all know, and we are all, uh, you know, proud of the fact that they created what they created in terms of an MA exit. But importantly, we are seeing both India market and the US market, and therefore a global story playing out for all of these uh, uh, entities. And that's where the ecosystem hopefully will drive uh, itself into and morph its, uh, itself into a bigger ecosystem. And, and you know, we all, uh, say for example, sitting in Pune, uh, assuming that most of the diaspora today uh, participating is in Pune, but across India as well, but Pune for sure, will continue to see a fair bit of activity on this uh, on on this PE and VC uh, uh, overall investment uh, scenario as i speak i can tell you for sure at least you know and we are a we we, we are a 60 plus uh, lawyer firm uh, still a small uh, firm uh, decent enough but still a small firm we are superly busy and you can uh, you can see for yourself that you know there is so much of activity for a firm like ours, what could be the activity level across board uh, as we you know, uh, uh, speak at this point in time? There is no dearth of capital. Uh, there is dearth of ideas. And there is dearth of good founders that people want to put in money. And I'm going to give some examples as we speak. Some I can take names if they are in public domain. But some I may not be able to take uh, uh, names because of uh, obvious reasons. So, uh, you know. Uh, let's 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 keep rolling and let's talk about some of these things. I'm obviously going to concentrate on the legal considerations, but given the setup, um, this is almost my hundred talk uh, uh, since COVID hit, and I'm now used to though, though I don't like it, uh, used to speaking to the wall, speaking to the screen. Uh, but uh, there are limitations, and therefore I'm going to keep it to a certain high level. And uh, obviously, you know, uh, you 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 have a chance of uh, putting questions to me. I'm going to talk till 12 noon. See if I can answer questions and maybe finish by 12:30. And again, I appreciate uh, the time that all of you are spending today, Saturday morning. Yesterday was Dasara, and uh, you know, really appreciate uh, everyone participating in this as such. So, uh, as I mentioned to you that there is a, a host of investment in stressed companies, uh, there is a lot of buyouts happening, there is a lot of uh, uh, activity, and one of the things that is happening is, uh, you know, th those who are familiar with the uh, alternate investment fund AIF structure, you see that the AIF has actually ballooned the investment, the family offices coming into play, there are small little uh, yeah, the, the pooled in money, as we call that in the AIF, all of them have suddenly come up. And today you have a mechanism of organized investment, which was missing. When we say that, you know, you're setting up a VC fund, it used to be a challenge. But now with AIF regulations, we do see people putting in as low as 25 crore, 50 crore of their family office money and making a systematic investment. Again, mushrooming this whole startup ecosystem. Uh, you know, moving into a right direction. There's a company which uh, exists in Pune, two founders. They sold one of their companies to an Indonesia-based uh, uh, company where Sequoia was their investor. And before they even exited after their lock-in into the company that they sold and they wanted to start a new venture, Sequoia was ready with their surge fund. Uh, many of you must have heard surge uh, of Sequoia Fund, which is into real early startup. It's a VC fund. 
and they put in money into these two founders knowing fully well that they you know in their first venture have done exceedingly well and the money came in so there's a plenty of money coming in there's a lot of activity with these early startup companies but remember the people who are getting money are the people who have actually shown a success in their past or come with a pedigree or come with uh, you know uh, some of the ecosystem which recognizes the fact that the risk associated with the investment at least on the people and the idea is to a certain extent mitigated and there are two sets of companies that you see one company which is essentially you know uh, doing a great job no doubt about that great idea but do not have visibility very hard to get money uh, in the early stage unless they are bootstrapped to a certain level and come to a level where uh, investors even the vc who are taking an early stage risk are willing to put in money uh, then you are doing a friends and family round and trying to go to a, a, a vc but to that extent there is that catch but if you have some pedigree you are able to show like the example that i gave you have an ability to reach out and get uh, you know investment in a jiffy there is a lot of money sitting in um, uh, essentially and then obviously the technology driven industries and e-commerce are the uh, are the place that are uh, still continuing to attract a lot of money but today we see uh, you know in a city like pune there is a host of investment coming into agri tech business uh, there is a host of investment coming into the uh, ev space uh the electric vehicle space uh, that's another uh, area that we are starting to see investment come in and then there are uh, things like the alternate energy uh there is where the investment is starting to see but all of them remember are in some shape or form using technology india has uh, you know not used technology to the hill but now each and every deal that you see there is definitely a technology angle to it it need not always be a algorithm based technology but you know there's a technology play uh, definitely happening and that's where the money uh, is uh, playing out and there's always this debate is today are we in oversupply on the capital uh, both on the private market and the uh, the the public market and answer seems to be right and you know hopefully touch wood the situation continues unabated but not every deal goes through and not every deal is something that you see uh, get getting consumed almost uh, 50% of the deals that start do not end up into a deal in 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 making and obviously these are large deals and therefore in public space these are public companies and therefore they have uh, a reason to disclose and they come in the public uh, uh, market and in the no and in the pink newspapers and uh, we all have a clear understanding of what happened with pnb what happened with uh, uh, reliance and future deal and so on and so forth but there are most of the deals which are uh, you know under the radar uh, and they never get reported many of these deals get lost for various reasons and we will see what those reasons are two main important things that come to my mind is the fact that wherever there is an assumption made and under diligence done we find that you know those deals don't make uh, the cut or even if they make the cut they end up into some legal mess somewhere or the other so there is no reason to believe that you know uh, i know someone i have uh, i have known someone as a friend uh, make you not do a proper diligence uh, as such both as an investor and as an investi company remember many a times what happens is because there is money sitting in the investee company that is the company which is wanting to get investment go blind spot with the investor without doing a proper diligence and nothing wrong with the investor as such but remember that you know people who understand the sector make it sound much better in terms of what you will have a relationship post the deal with the investor and therefore ability to having a success rather than just getting in money i used to work for persistent for long period of time and my first uh, my first uh, deal on the vc investment or private equity investment was in the year 2000 when intel made uh, you know a very small investment in persistent all of this is now public information they invested a million dollar obviously it was not meant as a intel capital investment but it was a, it was a business investment that they did 
2005 is when we seriously got money, about 100 crore at that point in time. You know, 100 crore today may not sound as, uh, you know, big an amount, but in 2005, it was a huge amount uh, that persistent attracted from a top tier VC. At that point in time, obviously, you know, money was important, but more important was a strategic uh, shift in thinking. And one of the things that we negotiated very well was to have uh, Dr. Pramod Haak, who is uh, considered as, uh, you know, a VC with Midas Touch. Um, and he was uh, number one VC on Forbes list for a long period of time to come and join our board. And that made a significant difference in terms of the strategy and in terms of what he brought on table uh, for Persistent. And obviously these small little changes that you make and which was a brainchild of Anand, uh, effectively made a lot of difference for Persistent to go public and rest as they call his history. But remember that some of these important negotiation tips is something that uh, you know happen over a period of time as you do multiple of these deals and learn out of each of these deals. Some of this is not purely legal and some of this is not purely, purely statutory, but everything adds up to make a good deal happen. And you must always understand as to what to negotiate and what not to negotiate makes a lot of difference overall ending up into a good deal from a, a, a long-term standpoint as such. And there is a lot of, a lot of things happening on the legal uh, framework as is happening on the tax framework. Uh, in terms of, uh, you know, this COVID making a change uh, in terms of how the meetings are held, what is the quorum, uh, how did India respond to the aggression by some of our neighboring countries. And to that extent, there have been certain changes both on the FEMA side, on the DIPP side, on the MCA side, and so on and so forth, which is making the deal making, uh, you know, very, very interesting. And as I said that the environment uh, you know, the government responded very well to the environment and we have a flexibility. That is something that we all are, uh, you know, uh, really, really taking help and the business is uh, working out uh, uh, really well. I'm going to concentrate on my presentation in these, uh, you know, a few uh, sections and I hope uh, we have time enough for me to speak. But again, uh, you know, uh, the, the idea here was to uh, provoke thought process. The idea is not to, uh, I make my living out of this and we have, uh, you know, decent uh, amount of team uh, who works uh, on all of these things. So uh, impossible to cover everything in two, year, two, two hours time, but let's, let's make an attempt to, uh, to, to see what we can do. So what's a private equity and venture capital? The biggest difference is in terms of uh, uh, the risk that they take. And as you can imagine, the private equity player is a late stage investor. A VC is an early stage investor, which means that they take higher risk. And therefore, uh, you know, the mortality with a VC investment is far more than the mortality uh, that the P's are, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, seeing. And therefore, VCs invest a uh, less amount of capital, at least in the early stage of the companies, whereas a private equity would uh, do a fairly large amount of investment, uh, you know, which is in the region of uh, 100 million, 200 million, and so on and so forth. And there are uh, different kind of private equity players, someone who's just a merely a, a financial investor, uh, someone who's a buyout fund, and so on and so forth. And you find that there's a distinct a difference between what a VC brings on table in terms of the risk that they take and therefore the kind of people that they bring on table from their standpoint versus a private equity player who's uh, you know making a serious serious investment uh, uh, and is essentially a late stage investor uh, and wanting to ensure that uh, there is a serious capital that is put in to put the company onto a different uh, orbit altogether. Both are important. 
uh, VC, if there is no VC money, the private equity players may not uh, uh, you know, be able to see a light of the company and they are uh, willing to make an investment, large investment into matured companies and that maturity comes because of the VC investments that happen. Both coexist, one feeds into other and therefore you know, in, in, in all of these things you will find that there are different nuances that people would expect uh, a VC investor would want the founders to have more skin in the game, which means that they take a minority or a significant minority, as we call that. Uh, whereas in the private equity, you will find that you know the private equity players many a times would want a majority to uh, run the show and would want to uh, essentially ensure that you know they have. Uh, control and they have control over the management team as well and therefore when you are making a deal you have to be cognizant of whether it's a venture investment or there is a p investment and therefore the deal terms might have a significant difference altogether uh, in both these frameworks like in an aif it's a pooled in funds with a general partner and a limited partner like the definition uh, suggests the general partner uh, is someone who has skin in the game, which means that they are on the execution side as well, fund management side as well, whereas uh, someone who's a limited partner has a limited role to play, as the name suggests, and they are essentially contributing to capital and their exposure is restricted to you know, the capital that they contribute. And when you hear today the news that uh, Northwest Venture Partner closed uh, uh, you know, fund eight of two billion dollars, which would mean that they went in the market, collected the money, and now are ready to deploy. And there will be limited partners like Wells Fargo Bank and so on and so forth, who are uh, you know supporting the cause that the uh, the Norwest Venture is uh, essentially doing. It's a different asset class that they are making an investment, and on behalf of the limited partners, general partner would take the bet of investing into companies like MindTickle, Persistent, and so on and so forth, uh, which gives return to the limited partner. And then there, is, there, is, there are you know, some of these terms like carry and so on and so forth, which is obviously not, uh, not what we are talking today. But it's a pooled in money. Uh, and then that pooled in money is deployed onto the portfolio of companies. And that is how uh, these guys make returns uh, as such. The, the investment process is very interesting. It's a long process. It is, uh, it is something which is, uh, you know, takes a, a decent amount of time. The planning takes a, a fair bit of time in terms of identifying these uh, opportunities. And therefore, uh, at any given point in time, you will find that uh, the, 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 the VC or the PE is essentially looking at multiple opportunities and they are competing against themselves. Today, if you look at a company like Baiju or you know, all these unicorns, it is, a, it is their market, it is an investee market at this point in time. Good ideas are attracting so much of capital that they, they are able to pick and choose as to who will they uh, you know, seek investment from. No more true that the SoftBank Vision Fund will have a field day of picking and choosing. Today, it's a reverse as well. Reverse is also true where you are seeing that the investee company is able to choose which investor to go to and which investor will add more value. And from their exit standpoint, the founders are also looking at multiple different options. And therefore, the process is becoming very interesting for, of course, the late stage companies. For an early stage companies, it's still a market where you are looking at Again, you know, obviously you ought to look at who's the right set of investor and therefore what is the deal that you're able to cook. But this investment process is not, not a one-way process, which is made out to be. It always should be a two-way process of the investee company also able to understand as to who and what would be the right investment that they will seek, essentially. Very, very important as uh, you know, I have seen uh, uh, in multiple deals is to define what is the primary goal. Is money the only thing? Is the market access another important uh, aspect? Is understanding of the market another uh, aspect? Is ability to connect to the ecosystem uh, uh, objective? 
what is your objective while, while you seek investment? And from an investor standpoint, obviously returns is a given that you know you want to make a alpha return and you know you want to beat the benchmark by a distance and see it as a multi-bagger. But essentially, apart from that, uh, you know, the, the the idea here is that are you trying to create a portfolio? Are you trying to, you know, uh, connect the dots as a portfolio of investment as an investor? All of that is a very important idea in terms of looking at what are the primary goals of the parties. And then what are, uh, you know, alternatives to achieve the primary goal? Remember that there, is, there are investors who will say that we want co-investment. Okay, we are not going to come only as a standalone investor. We are willing to commit $10 million. If it's a $20 million round or if it's a $15 million, we are the lead investors. We'll bring in 10 mil provided you get another 5 mil from another investor. And, you know, the idea here is to also look at if the other investors are validating the thought process. And it's not just me as an investor who's taking the bet. If there is a validation from someone else, then it's exciting for me. And then I'm looking at a, a way of mitigating my risk and making sure that the idea is validated. So you are, ought to see what are the alternatives to the primary goal. From the company standpoint, you don't want one single investor to have a majority control over the company and you are spreading that particular risk of these guys coming in together and trying to you know, take control of the company. And therefore, as a... Uh, investing company, you are trying to look at what are your alternatives. And there, there is very, very important to understand what options exist on table. And of course, time is critical and important, but within that given time, what best alternatives can you seek to achieve what is your primary goal? And very important is to identify how do you share risk. In any documentation, it's reflective of risk mitigation, right? I mean, you know, all the documents are written many a times in the negative thing, saying that it's a non-compete, which means you will not do this. There is a veto right. You will not do this provided unless, rather not provided unless I consent to it and so on and so forth. So you are essentially trying to look at a situation where you are wanting to provide a clarity in terms of what is, what is it that you want me to take the risk on and how am I mitigating? What is the investor looking at? Investor says that you will not compete. Investor says I will have veto rights. Investor says that there is, a, uh, there, there, there is an indemnity being given. There is a repre representation being made and so on and so forth. And that is how you actually share the risk associated with the investment as such. And one of the things that I have uh, learned uh, again is that, you know, it is all about the investee and the investor. It is, of course, about the, uh, the, the financer. It is, you know, if it's, if it's a venture debt or so on and so forth, it is about regulators. And it is also about the advisors, be the financial, legal, investment banker, and so on and so forth. But it always has to be an investee and investor. And, you know, because they are the primary drivers, what we call as a principal to principal uh, thought process. And then uh, the, the idea of creating a win-win situation is an extremely important trait as advisors uh, to, to, to look at, which does not mean that you succumb to anything and everything. But remember that, you know, it is two to tango and therefore it's a win-win situation, else there is no deal. And if there is no deal, you know, it's a bad deal uh, for everyone. And therefore, it's important to keep that in mind while you sit for negotiation. Unfortunately, the, the, the way the Indian ecosystem today on uh, the advisory side works is if I'm re representing either an investee or an investor, I take a stance completely adverse to the other side, which means that there may not be a deal that exists. I, as an investor, and I, as an investee, representing investor or investee have to create that win-win situation. But that thought process has to be from both side advisors. If only one advisor thinks both sides and one advisor is thinking only one side, then there is a problem. And I think that is where there is some shift that needs to happen. I'll give an example in terms of how uh, things work out from timeline perspective. 
if you are looking at a situation of a million dollar in india the same terms are put in for a deal which is a million dollar investment and a deal which is 100 million dollar investment one of the reasons that you see vibrancy in the uh, silicon valley that is in the california region and so many of these startups uh, get to the next level and the chances of success are many is because there is a lot of trust level and there is a defined rules with which things happen if it's a under a 10 mil deal or a, you know 5 mil deal there's a thought process with which things happen convertible note is a given uh, you know risk money is understood india is evolving from a uh, you know non risk money to a risk money and risk capital things are still not there it's changing but i think it is up to the advisors as well in terms of what you want your investors to uh, you know seek protection against and then uh, you know there's a lot of these kind of dialogues like the one that we are having now need to happen all the time for this ecosystem to evolve in a situation where i not just consider a adversary when i am representing on one side to the other but look at the whole deal in uh, you know in holistic manner that's the that's the uh, way i look at and obviously the process is a long process as i mentioned and the first two things which is the investment evaluation and primary negotiation take a long period of time and must take a long period of time from both sides remember it's highly competitive today both for the investor and the investee uh, and therefore uh, you know uh, it's important to ensure that you are looking at uh, a complete clarity in terms of what happens during the first two phase obviously uh, you know uh, that's not something that i'm going to talk in depth but very very important because many a times we from a legal standpoint start our engagement when the term sheet comes in for existing clients obviously the relationship is existing and therefore we start even when there is an um, uh, uh, evaluation that happens and there is a preliminary negotiation but many a times we start when the term sheet is already on table one of the things that is very important is to take legal counsel early on so any clients that you are advising many times they think that the term sheet ke baad we will take legal counsel and most of the time if the term sheet is signed without a proper uh, legal diligence around that and proper negotiation we find that you know you then post uh, the term sheet you are just you know uh, doing a uh, small little bit changes and that does not help at all the important aspect again the difference between what happens in the west and what's happening in india is you know people look at everything from a cost perspective and they will negotiate to the hilt with the advisors not knowing fully well that you know they will get compromised advice and that is not good from a long term standpoint it is therefore very important to educate clients as to why certain of this process cannot be short changed and there cannot be a shortcut to ensure you know what you are trying to build as a long term story and a serious money requires a serious advice and all of this process believe you me cannot be circumvented what are we talking about we are talking about an evaluation investment evaluation we are talking about preliminary negotiation and that preliminary negotiation is nothing else but the contours of the deal that you're talking about leading to a term sheet then to a diligence then to documentation then to closing and then you are building relationship with the investor that's the time from the time you've received money till the exit and then there is an exit that you see and that's the whole investment process that we're talking about and this is a marriage of 4 years 5 years 6 years before you see an exit and as i said india has started to see the exit and that's what is going to be an exciting thing where people continue to put in money what are we talking about term sheet most of the time these term sheets are non binding in nature why are they non binding in nature simply because these are early days the investor has not had the opportunity to do diligence on the company it is on 
the limited information that has been shared uh, like i said preliminary negotiation they have been done on the basis of what has been presented and has been taken on the face value but the term sheet will draw what the contours of the deals are which means the most important business commercial and legal terms will get added in the term sheet a non binding one except certain terms which are binding in nature like exclusivity all the investors who are investing would expect a exclusivity of certain period of time in these days it is anywhere between 60 to 75 days which is a standard uh, uh, exclusivity time where you cannot speak with others and the reason there being is that there is a serious amount of uh, investment that goes both of time and from money standpoint that you know the investor is going to appoint the advisors uh, on the on the business side finance side legal side for them to start the diligence and build the documentation and in that time if you go to someone else then you know there is a drain of uh, time and money and therefore there is an exclusivity which is a binding clause confidentiality is binding clause the jurisdiction is binding clause and most of the others are non binding in nature including the valuation remember that that after the diligence is when the uh, the valuation gets fructified validated essentially and therefore this is a non binding term sheet that is that is the first uh, what i call as a tangible step in terms of building a relationship i obviously have not put in an nda and so on and so forth which is obviously an important uh, uh, way of making sure that you are uh, protected on sharing of uh, data due diligence uh, you know uh, it, the 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 covid like you can't see me i'm not able to see the client and i'm not able to do a thorough diligence like you know many of you who are uh, in the audit space are uh, challenged because of some of these uh, uh, you know restrictions we have but even then most of the diligence is done online uh, you know people put in uh, put in all the request on dropbox and so on so forth and then uh, the diligence starts it is important that you have a proper team and a proper coordination between the finance tax and the legal teams who is part of the diligence so that a holistic data goes on uh, to 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 the investor and you know you are not disconnected in terms of what is uh, coming in it is also very important to look at what data is being asked and i, I, I again repeat is it a 100 million dollar deal or is it a 1 million dollar deal should determine what is the data that is being asked you can't you know uh, expect a, a everest climb for something which is you know a small amount of investment coming in and therefore rationalize what is being asked speak to the investor of the need of uh, you know looking at data which is which may not always be something that they should be looking at uh, not that you want to hide but you have to be practical in terms of what is the level of diligence that needs to go looking at the risk associated of the investment and that's a very important uh, aspect one of the things that is now starting to happen is the background check on promoters which is uh, you know there are a lot of tools there are a lot of technology tools that we are using in terms of trying to identify what's in public domain what's on social media what is uh, in the courts what's there what was in the court in terms of trying to see as to what is the background of the promoters because you know that's where the money is being put in and uh, to 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 that extent there is a lot of background check of the company and the promoters that's happening what we call as a litigation background check on uh, again a similar thing that's happening is on the intellectual property diligence um and uh, you know uh, we've seen horror stories in terms of what's being told and what's uh, what really comes uh, across both in this and in the mna side of things but very very clearly an important element on the background check that's the part of diligence as such in terms of uh, and assuming that you know diligence goes through the inputs of diligence are used in the definitive uh, document and i'm going to talk uh, uh, about it as we go forward but uh, very importantly 
you're looking at uh, three or four sets of documents, depending on whether it's a primary transaction or a secondary transaction. Uh, uh, you know, uh, you, you will have a share subscription agreement when new money is coming into the company. Uh, that's a primary transaction or a share purchase agreement if there is a, if there is a secondary uh, purchase uh, and, and obviously there is a shareholders agreement that defines the right interest between the company and the shareholders. And then, uh, uh, you know, almost in all deals, we are seeing a very tight, very tight employment agreement with the promoters. And you saw what happened uh, on an, uh, Flipkart and uh, you know the the founders uh, who 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 had to move out on the basis of uh, alleged violation uh, of the employment term. So that that becomes a very important and critical thing for the investor to protect their investment and for the uh, founder to see as to what would be the relationship uh, as they would they have three 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 sets of hats that they wear right. One they are a shareholder. They are a director in the company, and then they are also the employee of the company. And to that extent, all these three have to be looked upon separately. The directorship and the economic interest as a shareholder is in the shareholder agreement or also at times in the share subscription agreement, but their employment terms are protected through a promoter uh, employment agreement. And then there could be more of these documents depending on what and what is the contour of the deal. For example, on the intellectual property side, you might have a different uh, uh, agreement if the IP is in the uh, personal name of the founder and you know it's being co-used by multiple different companies in the group, then you might want to create a separate set of agreements uh, documenting that. There could be a uh, a bridge agreement uh, between two companies which are disjointed but in the same group or when you're doing a flip structure and taking investment uh, uh, in uh, you know you are today headquartered in India and you want to flip it to US then how does that work all of those are important considerations when it comes to definitive documents but at the minimum, you have a share subscription, share purchase, shareholder, and the promoter employment agreement, which get negotiated uh, deep in some of these uh, things. There is a lot of uh, paperwork that goes along, but uh, in the due diligence, you find disclosure requirements that are part of the definitive documents to protect the investor or uh, rather uh, to protect the founders from the liability that they take and we are going to talk uh, about it in some way and you know you uh, i'm sure there is a lot of uh, back and forth that happens with the tax advisor because uh, there are tax indemnities that uh, and the tax disclosures that happen uh, in the due diligence and you are giving uh, as a company the representation and warranties what we call as rnw backed up by indemnities and backed up by limitation on liabilities. All of this is something very important on the basis of what disclosure the company makes. And this disclosure requirement forms part of the definitive document to say that, you know what, we are making this representation on the basis of disclosure, which means they act as caveats to what's the representation that you are giving very important and critical in terms of disclosing. Now, remember two things that any of these documents, I call that as a liability document, simply because you know the capital that you receive is on the liability side. And like prospectus is called a liability document, all of these documents that we spoke about to me are all liability document because that's where the liability gets created. Whether it is for uh, the uh, in favor of the investor or in favor of someone else, but there is a liability that you are creating as a founder and therefore very important to look and take proper advice when you are you know, uh, seeking these investments and giving all of these governance warranties, business warranties, tax warranties, litigation warranties, fundamental warranties, and so on and so forth. After the documentation is done, 
there is what we call gap between signing and closing. When you sign a document, the document signature is not culmination of the agreement. The culmination is post certain conditions that need to get satisfied. For example, if you are uh, you know, uh, wanting to make investment and during diligence, you find certain lacunas or certain things which are missing and you want them to be fixed before the investment comes into play. It might be a demerger, it might be a flip structure, it might be certain things that you have missed out filing, it might be certain compounding situations and the investor says, you know what, I want to enter into a cleaner setup into something that we have structured well and therefore between signing and closing certain things need to happen which we what we call as a cp or what we call as closing conditions and that's something which uh, you know define the time from signing and closing remember there are uh, strategies that you need to adopt whether you want to sign and get into a legal binding situation where you ought to close on to taking on certain things before the money comes into the bank. Or you tell investor that, look, I'm going to sign only when I'm certain that I'm able to fulfill these conditions. For example, certain conditions uh, like passing of the resolution, uh, there are a lot of these uh, letters that flow, the board meetings that need to happen. That all is procedural matter, and that will happen because you know that's the beast of uh, uh, that is the nature of the beast, and you will do the certain things at that point in time. Those are procedural nature. I'm not worried about it. But something which is substantive, where there is a pendency with regulator, like this PNB, where they had to go to SEBI, uh, and you know, or for that matter, uh, the 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 future deal which is now stuck. Uh, with reliance for our, you know uh, different reason altogether do you want to fix those things first and then sign the document or you're happy to engage with the investor saying that you know what we will sign i'm fairly comfortable of closing these conditions and then i'm happy to close but a good way of dealing with these things is that there should be as less the gap as possible uh, not all deals it is possible but to a certain extent that you are able to do it is the fact that you are wanting to ensure that there is a limited time between signing and closing and you know if you google uh, certain of these uh, things you will find that covid no one thought it would be what it would be and when it stuck or for that matter in 2008 when there was a subprime crisis and remember uh, these events are happening once in a decade and these are real bad events that happen, but small little things always happen. And you have to be cognizant of the fact that, you know, not being too aggressive in terms of ho jayega, uh, you need to take a practical view of at what cost are you willing to sign and at what confidence level you have in terms of getting things done. See, when there is a private agreement to be done between signing and closing, no problem. But whenever there's a regulatory hurdle or a third party hurdle saying that, you know, this is pending consent from someone, unless you are sure that the consent will come through, do you want to sign is a very important point to be looked upon. Therefore, when you are entering into these definitive documents, you ought to consider what are the conditions to close and what are the closing conditions that you ought to take to make sure that you are, you know, not in a, uh, not in a situation where it becomes very difficult to close at times. Just do a quick time check, okay. Uh, and then there are certain conditions subsequent where the investor is okay to sign up to say that you know certain things can happen, like a DNO policy, uh, directors and officers policy. The investor, when he's coming in and he's on the board, he would expect you to take a DNO policy or he would want to make a change of name, or there could be a demerger situation, or there could be certain compounding applications to be filed. And the investor says, you know what, these are uh, you know, situations we understand. We do not want to stop uh, putting in money for these things, but 
this is a legal obligation and there could be consequence of not meeting those obligations as such and therefore important to understand what those conditions subsequent are and also important in the same breath to understand what are the consequences of not meeting those conditions as such if you are able to look at it then you know uh, there is a deal on table and you can within a time frame agreed complete those conditions after the money has been gotten in the bank calling this as a condition condition subsequent so these are some of the uh, you know players in the movie when the invest investment comes in and you know all of these are uh, very critical uh, essentially to any deal to happen and as i said it is about the investor and the investee and all of these uh, people are uh, you know in a supporting cast uh, role uh, that comes into play but they are all uh, a stakeholders in a particular transaction i'm moving to structuring considerations uh, in terms of what are the options available and today obviously uh, the deals when when you're looking at not a vanilla deal and it's a structured deal you will find that uh, there is a fair bit of uh, you know uh, structuring that happens uh, many a times because of tax reasons many a times at the time of exit the objective needs to be achieved and therefore uh, looking at what is the best structure to look at looking at the objective of deal the the structuring needs to happen and therefore uh, you have multiple of these options when you are looking at money coming into the company remember most of the times when the there is a vc investment and what we call as a series a vc investment there is a primary investment which means that the money comes into the company and not uh, where you have uh, where you have uh, uh, what i call as a secondary issuance you do not have that as a matter of fact but those things will happen in series b or even series c and series d what are we talking about we are talking about a rights issue uh, a preemption right as we call that or a or a preferential issue we are talking about bonus we are talking about private placement we are talking esop sweat equity and so on so forth in terms of looking at uh, options available for the company to get the primary investment going uh, by putting in uh you know by allotting fresh shares uh, as such and then let me skip this this is more theoretical in terms of private placement by uh, or preference shares uh but then you have a secondary investment and many of the transactions uh, do have a, a a reason where uh, you know there is an investor who's exiting or there is some part of the liquidity for the founders in series b series c round as i said and they are all what we call as uh, you know secondary transaction purchase of shares from the existing uh, uh, investor uh, the the aspect is obviously you don't want any encumbrance on the shares there could be an escrow mechanism put in place and so on so forth that all will depend on what structure you are trying to build and there are many transactions uh, in series c and plus rounds where there is you know a combination investment as we call that where there is both primary that is money coming into the company and there are existing investors moving out for example uh, the company does not want a lot of money and therefore there is a small portion uh, which is subscribed into the company but there is an exit required to be given and the incoming investor says that i am not going to come unless i get a minimum percentage of equity in the company or it's not worth my time and therefore you would want to structure it both as a primary and secondary deal and you are seeing a host of these deals in a larger transactions especially in um, in a 100 mil 50 mil plus transactions where you know there could be even esop as a part of a secondary deal where you know the investor is saying you know what i'm going to buy this 3% by giving a, a exit to the employees and thereby creating liquidity for uh, the employee who have held on to the stock for a while so we are seeing a fair bit of combination investment and there you are doing both the share subscription share purchase 
and obviously shareholder agreement in these combination investment uh, uh, as such. Uh, uh, another one, I don't know if uh, I, I'll get time to talk about, but let me speak about when you have multiple set of investors, how do you create document to give rights to one set of investors separate than a sec second set of investors without diluting both parties rights becomes very tricky when it comes to the document. Remember someone has invested at an early stage where the investment may be small, but he gets a larger chunk because it's a risky investment. Whereas at the second stage, the investment ticket size has increased, but the percentage, because the value of the company has increased, the percentage may be less. And here is the tussle that happens. The incoming investor says, you know what? I am putting in an, an absolute number far, far, far more as compared to someone who's put in money at an early stage. And therefore, I should be you know, at least pro rata the rights that the existing investor has versus the right that the, in, uh, uh, the, the existing investor has. And at times, the incoming investor says, I, I will be senior to the existing investor because even though my percentage share may be less, I'm actually putting in more amount of money. That's a significant risk that I'm taking. Now, you know, there are arguments on both sides and it is very, very important that at the time of term sheet, you define what is going to be the rights and responsibilities of the existing investor vis-a-vis -vis the incoming investor, simply because you don't want to become a sandwich if you're a investee company and you're representing an investee company in terms of uh, all of this. Remember that the existing investors may have their own set of advisors, the, the company may have their own set of investors, uh, rather uh, advisors, and the incoming investors would have their own set of advisors. And think about the chaos if the process is not managed well. And therefore, you know, it is very important and critical at the time when you draw the term sheet and the contours of the deal that you have thought through all of these situations, especially when you have multiple investors in a quick uh, uh, point in time. Then there are these offshore structures and onshore structures that require you to be very vigilant in terms of what we call as a flip structure that we spoke uh, in brief, or the investor putting in an offshore fund or an uh, you know, onshore fund. So many a times uh, we are starting to see that you know, there's an AIF that is being created offshore or there is, you know, simply they're directly making an investment of what we call as a foreign direct investment. And all of those are some, uh, you know, things that the investor would look at. And, you know, they look at a lot of these exit situations and determine what would be the tax scenario if they were to enter offshore or onshore. And does it make sense? Also, you know, it depends on the, uh, the investor's appetite and intent of continuing to invest into India multiple uh, ways, or are they looking at this as just one-off investment? Learn and maybe then look at multiple uh, structures as such. So, you know, depending on, again, the objective that the investor has will determine how you would want to structure a particular transaction from an investor standpoint. And then, uh, uh, as I mentioned to you, that there are uh, structures where uh, the investors may use an AIF, FDI route, or uh, you know, a portfolio route, depending on that. There are uh, obviously advantages and disadvantages of using it. It is all very situational, but uh, importantly, SEBI rules and regulations, income tax, and uh, FEMA have to be considered in depth before a structure is fructified as such. Remember, diligence also, say for example, you might have thought about a structure when you are uh, looking at uh, a pre-diligence term sheet uh, point of view, but the diligence might, led, uh, might lead to a different structure and therefore term sheets build uh, flexibility 
to determine a structure or to adjust the structure after the diligence is carried out. Cross-border transactions where money is coming into India from overseas require pricing guidelines and taxation to be looked upon carefully. And uh, therefore, you are uh, you know, uh, looking at FEMA very, very carefully as you determine at how do you essentially structure. Because as you know, under FEMA, there is a restriction of uh, staggered uh, or deferred payment, both from time and percentage. Uh, and therefore, when deal is in tranches and the deal is spread over a period of time, how you structure that makes it very, very interesting as such. I spoke about this in terms of multiple investors, in terms of uh, how you manage it, and that's very, very critical on to uh, you know, late stage deals as they get complicated as such. Let me stop here and uh, check with Mehul if there are any questions that allows me to take a bit of breath as well, and then I'll deal into key legal clauses. Mehul? Uh, not much. Only one, only one question is from Mr. Suhit Agarwal, which says that is the exit of promoter in the form of PE permissible as per the regulations? The general understanding is that promoter group have to lock in for nearly three years from the IPO. So I'm not sure whether it is pre-IPO or post-IPO. The question is. Yeah. So I mean, I think you know that there is a difference between a pre-IPO and post-IPO. Uh, companies who go IPO, for example, Zomato, the promoters have a lock-in. Those provisions also have undergone change. The, the change is now the lock-in is for a restricted period of 12 months as compared to three years of 20% uh, uh, shareholding. So when persistent went IPO uh, in the year 2010, the regulation set three years uh, lock-in of 20% of the post-paid capital but now uh, the regulations have changed and the regulations are changing for this new age companies given the fact that uh, it's one difficult to determine who's the promoter. The definition of the promoter is undergoing change. Therefore, promoter group is undergoing change and therefore the lock-in provisions is undergoing change. But more so when we speak about the exit, I'll try and address uh, about this uh, in depth on the exit rights as well. Let me keep moving. Uh, the key legal clauses. Okay. So there are a lot of these legal clauses, you know. <laughs> so we make living out of this. So you can imagine that uh, one, there is complexity, no doubt about that. Uh, and there are certain things, you know, what I was talking about is some of these things in the US is cast in stone in a sense that if it's a particular deal, and everything being all set in motion, there is a way in which some of these things work and lawyers, you know, trust each other and they go and move. Uh, in India, unfortunately, all of this is up for negotiation. And that is where it takes a long time. And there is where possibly we could learn over time and create this ecosystem which works well. Many times we see that early stage, especially early stage, there is a investment that happens in tranches, which means that suppose there is a 10 mil investment committed, the first tranche will come with say 5 mil uh, as such, and the next 5 mil will be subject to achieving certain milestone. Now, when th this happens, you have uh, you know complexity in terms of what happens if the milestone is not achieved. What happens if the milestone is achieved in, in a certain percentage? What happens if uh, you know, the investor does not have money at that point in time, even though the milestones are achieved? And then you ought to look at all scenarios and build your document accordingly. There's nothing right or wrong uh, with uh, the approach because it's a commercial intent both parties uh, looking at, but both parties have to consider various scenarios when you are looking at investment in tranches. You know, one of the one of the ways people look at when there is an investment in tranches is to say that, you know what, we will give you proportionate shares and the rest is put in escrow. Uh, you know, both the money or the shares, depending on how you are looking at uh, uh, the structure to happen. 
many of these times uh, you ought to look at uh, the practicalities uh, and early stage companies who are susceptible to multiple challenges the investors are very clear that they they they're making a commitment provided the milestones are met the reps and warranties very very important uh, you looking at a situation where the investor is saying that you know what we've done diligence but we want an assurance uh, on what we have seen you make a disclosure as part of your disclosure schedule but uh, we want all these reps and warranties come our way what is that it is nothing but a statement of fact to say that you know there could be a knowledge disclaimer saying that to your knowledge you know certain of these things are true and on that basis is what we are making investment these are elaborate reps and warranties to protect investors uh, to and and as as many of you would know when there is a misrepresentation this is called as representation and a breach of that would therefore be called as misrepresentation and under contract law a misrepresentation allows the non breaching party to rescind the contract or to make the contract void or put it in the same situation as they would have been if there was no misrepresentation and so on and so forth and therefore it's important to look at what these reps and warranties are all about which are backed up by indemnities right i mean the reps of reps and warranties are matter of fact if they happen to be untrue which means that there is a misrepresentation then what is the backup what is the insurance to the investor and therefore there is an indemnity clause attached to it and then indemnity the founders would want to protect themselves on unlimited liability and therefore they would say that we would want to protect ourselves from the liability is not an unlimited liability or there is no consequential liability i will take a direct hit and that could be up to the level of what we call as a uh, investment amount remember the way all of these things gets negotiated is that there is a time cap to the representation that i am giving representation and which will hold good for a certain period of time so in law the limitation of law is about 3 years many of the cases the tax laws have a different limitation period so you know we go up to 8 8 years uh, or the fundamental representation to say that you know the shares that we hold are all correct in all in order not lien not encumbered those are what we call as fundamental reps and warranties there is no time cap to it but then you break the warranties into three buckets fundamental warranties tax warranties and other warranties other warranties you could put a time cap of 3 years tax warranties a time cap of 8 years and there is no time cap for the the fundamental warranties uh, the reps and warranties and that indemnity will also follow through in the manner that the indemnity is you know the only remedy for the investor and there is no other remedy under the contract that you are signing and then you put on a liability again on the liability side you put a higher threshold on maybe the tax indemnities because you know that's direct money lost but for the others you could have a certain percentage of the investment that you are bringing in there is also a concept of grossing up to say that the investor says you know what i am 20% of the company and if the company is going to make the indemnity good then i am anyways out of pocket by 20% so gross it up to my investment amount and therefore you know so if the if the liability is taken as x it's grossed up to the investment percentage of the investor and therefore you know the investor get full protection after the money is being brought in by the promoter or the company in any ways you are seeing that the investor is in the same situation before the breach happened and before the indemnity was invoked as such then obviously there is a non compete non solicit uh, situation where the founders would we required to uh, very clearly articulate that you know they will not compete against the company they will not solicit the employees of the company or the 
customers of the company, uh, even when they are not part of the company. So if the founders decide to move on, then obviously there are consequences on his shareholding. But apart from that, he cannot have, because he plays the fiduciary role, he cannot take over, uh, you know, the, the, the employees, the customers, and can't set up the same sort of business for a certain period of time. So these clauses are both embedded in the shareholder agreement uh, as well as the employment agreement. Because remember, as I mentioned, they have a different legal implications as such uh, around the co-founders. And then you have founder lock-in. Founder lock-in, uh, as everyone would uh, understand, that it is about the people and the company making that investment uh, is about uh, uh, the people. And therefore, they would expect the founders to sign up for a certain minimum period or uh, or till the investors are in the company as investors up to a certain percentage, what we call as a fallout provision. So if the investors are holding investment for, uh, you know, uh, with, with say 5% at least in the company, then all of these rights persist. Very, very important. Investors also want their rights to be, uh, you know, uh, uh, their investment to be protected and certain of the matters have to be done with their concurrence, what we call as a restrict, restricted matters, RMs, or uh, veto matters, which means that they can, those matters can be dealt only after taking their consent. I'll give two, three examples where we find it very, very difficult to navigate, important from the investor standpoint, but important from the founder standpoint as well. We are in a uh, you know precarious situation on a couple of deals where there is a veto matter and veto given to the investor for further fundraise. The situation is that the company needs money. The investor is unwilling to put in money and is also unwilling to let the founders raise the fund, uh, further round from a set of investors. The founders are stuck, they need capital, but there is no way they are able to get that capital because there is a stonewalling by the investor. Right or wrong, separate story. But there is a veto that has been exercised and the founder is not willing to or is unwilling to make that change uh, in the situation and they are not willing to go and uh, use uh, 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 their wisdom in terms of allowing for whatever reason that. So it cuts both ways. And at times, you know, there are reckless founders who would go and uh, raise capital from anyone and everyone at whatever valuation. Uh, and therefore, there is a situation of uh, a conflict of interest and that is being protected by veto matters. There's a concept of anti-dilution, which I have not put in in these, but there's a lot of uh, uh, debate that goes around in terms of protecting the rights of the investor. And the anti-dilution right goes in a manner where if the company takes further investment at a value which is less than the value at which the investor has come in, then to the extent of that is the delta in the valuation, additional shares will be issued by the company to investors at no cost. And that's an anti-dilution provision protection that the investors would expect. Nowadays, because of this situation, larger deals especially, where the company may you know, move to some other investors, for no fault of investors, there is a breakup fees uh, being put up, both from the company side and from the investor side to say that, you know what, if everything is fine and we are not changing the uh, valuation, you ought to take this money from us. And if you don't, then there is a breakup fee. Uh, because, you know, there's a whole lot of effort that has gone into it. And not just the money part of it. Remember that there is a goodwill part of it as well, saying that X company rejected the investment from Y investor. It has a lot of market uh, uh, situation to be dealt with by the investor. And similarly, when the investor rejects out and it goes in the public space. And remember, while there is confidentiality and all of that, the community is so well-named 
that uh, you know the information gets passed on and at that point in time the company also may want to have a breakup fee to say that you know what we played our part now you play your part but if you are unwilling to then there is a breakup fee that you look at the other uh, thing very interesting thing that comes is the jurisdiction many a times we have seen uh, even in a normal transaction people succumb to a uh, jurisdiction outside of india saying that you know what the investor has his office outside of india and they would want protection in that or maybe in a neutral territory remember that the cost of litigation is far just too many and if you are a smaller company and you are representing a founder who doesn't have wherewithal of fighting outside of india fighting in india is a problem fighting out of india is out of question remember that you know you could be susceptible to some of these legal wards which you will lose even before the ward starts and therefore choose your jurisdiction and the dispute resolution mechanism extremely carefully don't succumb to the fact that you know the investor is outside of india and therefore wanting to make this investment in the territory and in the jurisdiction of his choice it could be very very detrimental as well as could be uh, what we call suicidal effectively you negotiated all the agreements but you didn't negotiate the jurisdiction well could end up you playing in the home territory of uh, the investor and remember there is a home advantage but you as a company will send, seldom go and sue the investor there have been very very limited cases of where uh, people have gone and uh, you know uh, sued investor at least in the indian context is the other way around possibly it is the other way around not that the investors have also gone to court but the chances of investor going to court is far more than company going against the investor because of the obvious nature choosing the jurisdiction and dispute resolution mechanism is a very critical uh, uh, process as such and what are we trying to do by looking at all of this we are trying to mitigate the risk the investor is trying to mitigate his risk the company and the promoter is trying to mitigate his risk and there 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 goes what we call as a tug of war and that is where the interest have to be protected by each side therefore there are certain industry standard practice where you will have r and w so suppose you know the company and the promoter say that we will not give representation there is possibly no deal because uh, that's a fundamental thing if you go and go to buy a house uh, and someone says you know what uh, title is not my responsibility and i'm not uh, writing anything about the title you go and figure out and uh, you know it's as is deal you might want to not take that deal and similarly the investor may not want to take a deal where the rnw is not uh, made uh, etc or if there is a criminal uh, uh, say for example in the diligence there is a criminal uh, case against the promoter the investor might say that you know what it's not uh, worth taking that particular risk and there is no indemnity uh, situation if there is uh, a criminal matter it's a criminal matter no amount of indemnity will make it uh, good and from a company and promoter standpoint obviously there is a fair bit of risk that you take when you are signing up with an investor and the biggest risk is what happens if there is some unbun with the uh, investor some tutu maime with the investor what happens then till the time everything is all good no one will question anything but these are all documents made for worst case scenario and you ought to promote uh, ought to think about those and be protective remember the investor goes through the process and the people will speak you will be subjected to a harsh reality of litigation if you don't take care and you don't protect your uh, interest and uh, and you know we do see a lot of a uh, uh, lot of these arguments that no 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 i know the investor or even from a investor standpoint no we've done a fair bit of diligence on the uh, promoter and we don't foresee the risk etc etc and people at times take aggressive stance that may not always be a right way of looking at it a dispassionate look on the investment a, a, a clear understanding of what the consequences of uh, you know not meeting uh, with the 
a set of guidelines have to be understood and documented as such. I'm moving on to the management consideration. Sorry, you know, this is, uh, this is like, as I said, speaking to the wall, I don't clearly understand uh, the reactions of all of you. Bear with me. Uh, I'll open this for questions uh, soon. But, uh, and there's a lot to talk. I have a, you know, detailed presentation. Let's see if we uh, get a chance. Let me stop here and see if there's any other question, uh, Mehul. Yeah, uh, Sridhar sir is asking, is your, in your practical experience, whether funding happens at the valuation report put forward by the investing company or do investor upon their own valuer? How difference in valuations are generally dealt with? Okay, let me, let me answer that question because I think uh, that's a very important and significant one. And that's where the deals are made or not made. Uh, from the valuation standpoint. And, you know, one of the things that uh, uh, I have learned is uh, at the early stage, it all depends on which stage of the company that you're dealing with. And early stage company, there's no point in haggling on the valuation. Uh, our clear view is that a convertible note works far better where uh, you define the value on the next round of funding with a discount uh, attached to that round of funding. For example, you say that, you know what, if you get a five mil of investment in a two year time frame from closing, you will get converted into equity at a 20 or 30% discount. That is a model, uh, an early stage company is far better uh, looking at rather than looking at a model where you are trying to, you know, haggle on the valuation because it's very difficult. Uh, to answer a specific question, the valuation report as such plays a very insignificant part simply because these valuations are gut feel valuations. Uh, only when you are moving to a significant round of funding is when certain of these exercises make a lot of difference. But again, you know, the investors have their own set of methodology, which they don't disclose uh, many a times before they zero on the valuation. Uh, because, you know, again, there is a lot of risk uh, uh, mitigation done on the DCF or any of the uh, valuation methodology that is uh, applied to. And again, when it is a competitive stage, you're looking at uh, taking a bet on multiple different variable factors. So not always is a typical valuation exercise done. Obviously, the valuation uh, from a compliance standpoint is uh, something that happens post uh, uh, the, the, the parties have shook hands and uh, closer to the deal consumption uh, 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 simply because there is a 30-day window uh, prescribed by law in many uh, of these primary investments uh, before which you take uh, the, share, the, the valuation certificate. So my answer is that uh, the valuation is done uh, more as a business valuation rather than as a, 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 a compliance valuation at the time when the deal is being made. Early stage companies are better off looking at a convertible note rather than a, a, a zeroed on valuation. Third, a valuation exercise done by the valuer uh, or rather than investor is far more involved with multiple different factors as compared to a valuation certificate that is being taken at the time when the deal is consummated. So it's a, it's a complex thing, no clear answer to it. Uh, and, you know, it, it evolves over a period of time uh, at, with, with a different stage of investments as such. The second was uh, from Sachinji. Uh, it is generally the term sheets are non-binding offer and therefore what could be possible financial or legal negative consequences if the deal, deal does not go through post due diligence stage, either because of financial negotiations or on account of non-agreement to the indemnities representation, etc. Right. So, I mean, uh, uh, Sachin, the, uh, the, there's risk to both sides. Um, the diligence may throw certain surprises which were not told before, or 
the business environment might have changed. Like I said, during the first COVID uh, wave, you know, people just simply said that we will not honor the term sheet simply because of the change, a significant change, what we call as a material adverse event, uh, MAC or material adverse condition uh, that gets set up. And, you know, some of these are what we call as event uh, outside of the control of both parties. And some of these things happen. Some of these things happen because the investor might have gotten a separate uh, investment opportunity or the company might have got a separate uh, investment opportunity or some other investor. And therefore, uh, the term sheet at times has this, what we just spoke about, is the breakup fee. So that's a financial consequence. The consequence is obviously loss of time. The consequence is loss of goodwill at times. The consequence could also have significant financial impact if the deal is not closed. The company might have assumed certain things, started to spend, started to hire people, started to put uh, things in place, started to take risk on the assumption that the money will be gotten. So there are multiple consequences that uh, can happen. The term sheet can only address a few and the few is the financial consequence saying that, you know what, if you don't consume, pay me 10 crores. If it's a large deal, obviously, or pay me a crore of rupees. So what are you trying to do is you're trying to create a deterrent for both parties not to eject out of the deal for frivolous reason. If those frivolous reasons, uh, you know, if it's a uh, you know business reason, or I might discover something as an investor during the diligence phase, and I come back to you and and say, hey, Sachin, you know what? I'm going to put down the value from X to point eight X. Are you willing to take a twenty percent haircut? And I give you an objective reason why I'm doing so. Then it is up to me whether I make a deal happen or not. Or you come back and say, you know what? I see a risk and I want you to take more responsibility in the agreement by taking on more liability than what you otherwise would have been. Are you willing to do that? Are you having a skin in the game? And if I don't, then there may not be a deal and I should be ready to face the consequences. And similarly, from a company standpoint, we had a, a very uh, uh, you know, a precarious situation uh, about two months back where our client pulled out of a particular deal, realizing later on what he signed on the term sheet is not market standard. And we were telling that, you know, this is not market standard. And at, uh, you know, at a later point in time, when he discovered uh, another set of investor, he went on to, and the exclusivity period was over. At that point in time, he said to the investor with whom he had signed a term sheet, obviously non-binding that I'm not going ahead. He went on with the new investor and that new investor at a later point in time said, now I'm not going to invest. And today the situation is that the client doesn't have an investment and now he's going organic way in, 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 in some uh, way or the other. So you, are, you look at these situations all the time. Not all term sheets go through into a final documentation and therefore it is very important and critical that you should be overly prepared for your due diligence and not start to prepare after the term sheet is signed. We advise our clients that be fully prepared so that you cut down time from signing of the term sheet to money in the bank. And remember that the only test of a successful deal is money in the bank. No amount of negotiations, no amount of documentation give you the comfort of money in the bank and the deal is done when the money is in the bank and the shares are transferred to the investors. So therefore, these term sheets are non-binding in nature and fraught with risk. And there are strategies that you would want to uh, make to ensure that the deals don't fall through and uh, you, know, you don't have egg on the face both sides, whether as an investing company or as a investor. The last question, is what is the significant and use of arbitration and conciliation proceeding in PVVC funding based on your practical experience, whether it is recommended to include such clause, uh, such clauses in share purchase agreement or shareholders agreement? 
Oh, yes, absolutely. Meaning, you know, the dispute resolution uh, is a must. Whether you use a court mechanism or mediation or arbitration and conciliation depends on how you look at life. Remember, it all depends on who you're representing and what is the fast outcome that you want. For example, as an investor or as an investee company, you do not want dispute to be lingering because it will hurt the company one way or the other. If you have a dispute with your investor or the investor has a dispute with the company, whatever you look at, that company starts to go down very, very fast. No other investor will touch that particular company because there is an impending, meaning, you know, I'm making a generic statement, but there's always an exception, leaving that exception. No investor would want to see a disputed company, a company in dispute, founders in dispute, where they will put in their money. And no customer, and you know, some of these uh, conversations go in public domain, and no customer would want to look at uh, all these situations. Therefore, you want an early resolution to the dispute. As we know, in India, the courts take their own time. These are civil wrongs, and therefore, you ought to create a dispute resolution mechanism which is faster, even though costly. Remember, the court process may be less costly but time consuming. The arbitration process is costly, maybe quicker, and therefore people choose, say at times Singapore, as a, a place to complete arbitration uh, because you know it's that much faster, quicker, but it's costly. You have to be cognizant of that. And depending on your objectives and which side you're uh, uh, looking at, you choose what is your jurisdiction, meaning you know, which law will apply to this? Assuming that it's a cross-border, are you looking at India? Are you looking at outside of India? Second choice is, are you looking at court? Or are you looking at arbitration? The third choice is, which language? The fourth choice is, are you looking at doing it online? Or are you looking at doing it in person? So there are a lot of variables that go along. As I was saying, in my, uh, you know, uh, just few minutes back on the legal clauses, don't let go of the jurisdiction and the dispute resolution clause because someone says, you know, this is how we deal with it. No, because, you know, after having negotiated everything, if you are pushed to Switzerland uh, to do an arbitration, believe you me, it's no fun. Obviously, you know, going to Switzerland may be fun, but fighting in Switzerland will take your uh, you know shirts and pants away that's you know it's damn expensive going in london arbitration new york arbitration uh, you know all the exotic places uh, you have to be cognizant of what your client can afford and what is the reality of it if all the assets are in india if all the founders are in india if the company is in india then you ought to look at this situation Therefore, when people say that, you know, we want to flip the structure to Singapore, US, etc., you have to understand that when you do so, and should there be any legal uh, situation arise, do you have wherewithal of fighting it in that jurisdiction? Can you fight that out? Can you set aside $500,000 and a million dollars of legal cost and fees to be able to do that? And, you know, that's some consideration that you ought to make and not get emotional about the fact that, you know what, the investor is pushing me hard. He will push you hard uh, uh, to, to, to go into jurisdiction which is not friendly to you. He does not want to give you a choice which is friendly to you because uh, if you happen to be adverse to them, they could uh, end up into a major situation and therefore the jurisdiction clause plays a very, very important role overall in terms of balance of who, uh, you know, has a better uh, view about uh, those situations as such. Long answer, but important one. That's, uh, those are the only questions right now. All right, let me keep going. Uh, it's 12.10, I'm cognizant of the time. I'll try and see how much I can, uh, uh, you know, quickly uh, take a quick view off and then uh, I'm going to leave this presentation with you so you can go through and happy to answer questions outside of this forum as well.
uh, management consideration, which means that uh, you're looking at some of these incentives to key people who have been retained, where you already may have an existing plan or you want them to continue after uh, the investment has gotten in and the investors insist at times that you ought to have an ESOP plan because it's all about the team and you want to keep uh, the team motivated, encouraged and engaged. And through these ESOP, SARS, sweat equity plan, you're able to make some of these things happen really, really well. I must say that, you know, ESOP is back with vengeance and every company, whether it's a small, large, into a technology or otherwise, including banks, manufacturing companies, all are using ESOP now with vengeance. What are the rights granted to the shareholders? We spoke about it in some way or the other, but you have anti-dilution rights, ROFR, preemptive right to protect their investment, veto rights, we spoke about them, governance rights, which is, you know, should you be on the board or should be should you be on the advisory board and so on and so forth. The transfer restrictions, very important from the investor. What happens if the promoter were to sell? Do you have a tag along? If there is no exit being given, can you drag the promoter? Those are important rights that the shareholders would have under the shareholder agreement as such. Remember, these rights are negotiated heavily. There are certain uh, set rules, but uh, all of this is up for negotiation. You could look at uh, negotiating this uh, in depth when you are uh, you know, dealing with the shareholder agreement. Lock-in period, both from the uh, company standpoint, rather the founder standpoint, as well as the investor standpoint is an important element. Uh, do you expect the investor to lock in uh, in terms of uh, their shares? that you won't sell for three years. We are starting to see that being a demand from some of the founders where they expect the, uh, except for obviously fraud and certain situations, uh, you expect the founder, the, the investors to continue. And obviously the investors would want a lock-in from the founders saying that, you know what, till we are around or till a certain period of time, you will not go and sell uh, uh, as such. And then uh, obviously what is the termination consequence we have this housing.com as an example where uh, you know the 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 founder was uh, unceremoniously uh, shown the door for various reasons up for uh, uh, discussion purpose as to what was right or wrong but then what is the consequence if the uh, uh, employment is terminated of the founder for cause or without cause and some of those things which uh, we spoke about on non compete non solicit and consequences on the breach of these uh, terms as such. Governance rights, veto rights, we've spoken about it, um, how they play out, which rights to give, which not to give, very important. We, have, we see a laundry list, unfortunately, even in the smallest of investment, may not be good even for the investor to scuttle the pace at which you allow the investee company to grow. Remember that you know you are only successful as an investor when you are uh, you know giving freedom to the, uh, the, uh, the 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 founders to run the show. But if you do not give that particular thing, it is your investment. In the same breath, you also want protection so that there is no reckless behavior from the founders, uh, uh, and you know which is detrimental to the interest of the uh, investor. So there's a balancing act that you ought to make in terms of what is right for the business ought to be what we call as uh, horses for the courses. That is how exactly you would want some of these rights. And these are philosophical conversations, important conversations to have to understand what is right for the business and accordingly put that in place. Who has operational control at the private equity investment uh, level? This question becomes very, very critical. Uh, you know, remember many a times the private equity player has a majority, maybe a simple majority, but majority, and therefore he will expect certain operational control as such. And even in the smaller investment, there are uh, you know certain issues where they will say that 
uh, capex beyond a certain point uh, and certain uh, level has to be with uh, with the approval of the investors as such non compete non solicit we have spoken confidentiality not to forget that as as sachin rightly asked what happens if the deal does not go through and you know the investor has done the diligence remember uh, it all has to be done under the confidentiality obligation you can't just go learn about my business not make an investment and go scout free making another investment and we've seen uh, multiple conversations where uh, you know there was no obligation obviously under law there could be a, a situation where the investor is uh, put to an obligation even without a written obli uh, confidentiality obligation but it's that difficult and you ought to keep this confidentiality obligation as a in writing obligation from an investor standpoint as well i'm going to skip the valuation part because that's something that uh, you know you know uh, except for the fact that valuation is becoming very important in the deal making uh, while from a compliance standpoint relevant date may be uh, at the time when you are looking at uh, the transaction to get consummated but is an important element not to neglect it is not just the business valuation but the compliance valuation as well to be looked upon both for direct equity investment convertible equity investment valuation when you are issuing to non residents and when you are issuing convertible securities to non resident last but not the least when you are doing consideration other than cash where you know there is a lot of uh, uh, someone's bringing in ip someone's uh, uh, essentially doing a uh, uh, a future uh, what i call future uh, services to be provided against which the investment is being shown and so on and so forth all of those requires a registered value to play an important part um, and again you know chartered accountants registered valuers merchant bankers all of them have a role to play when it comes to valuation different set of rules now with the registered value coming into play but uh, interesting uh, overall uh, situation that we are seeing there was a question on exit exit obviously is the reason why these investments are made and therefore uh, you know it is important to understand whether the investor is a strategic one or a financial investor and therefore uh, you know the exit strategies have to be looked upon and as i said now with somato ipo ipo is going to be one of the key exit mechanisms for uh, the investors as we see the documentation but usually you have three or four levels of hierarchy in which you will have uh, the exit uh, to be looked upon first and foremost to think about is is there a lock in which means that during that lock in no one is able to exit and you need some stability for the company and you can't have the investor exit immediately except when there are governance issues there are there is some fraud or some of those corner cases established leaving those aside uh, you are looking at a situation where you are uh, essentially uh, having a certain time frame after which the exit rights kick in assuming that this is 3 or 4 years down the line you have a third party as a, you, you you might have a roofer right first where the promoters or the other investors have a choice of making that investment by way of the investor selling into them as a right of first refusal to the founder the other way could be a third party if there is no uh, no one willing to buy then it could go to a third party there could be a buyback there could be a, a, a ipo and so on so forth as a strategy to be looked upon now the question comes as whether it is an obligation on the company or the obligation on the founder many a times this language plays an important role remember that there is no guarantee of an exit and that's the you know beauty on an unfortunate part of this kind of investment and you are susceptible to a risk money this is all risk money and there is no guarantee that there will be an exit and there will be an exit with an irr built in into the agreements and therefore you know 
the obligation language is always has to be looked upon on a best effort basis versus a legal obligation being taken. Remember, this is not a loan and this is, uh, you know, fraught with risk and the market condition and so many variable factors decide whether there will be an exit or if there is an exit at what value will there be an exit. Obviously, there is a desire, no, uh, nothing wrong with that desire, but importantly, in terms of the language that you take and the language that you build in the document, when it comes to an exit becomes very important, especially when a promoter takes a personal obligation vis-a-vis uh, -vis an exit. What is the exit period and how do you write your drag clause? Assume that all has been looked upon, all options have been exhausted, there is no exit. At that point in time, the drag right could also kick in. What is the drag right? The drag right essentially would mean that, you know, if I as an investor have not been provided with an exit, I can then go out in the market, find a buyer, and the buyer might say, you know what, I'm going to buy all and not less than 100%. So I want 100% and not less than 100%. And therefore, I should, as an investor, have the ability to drag all others to the party and I then get an exit. Think about it. If you have multiple investors and each one of has drag, but they don't have a drag against themselves, then how does this situation pan out? And therefore, you know, when you have multiple set of investors, it becomes important to write down with clarity, this is those different set of investors who have come in different round of investment, what are the rights inter se between them? Otherwise, you could have a precarious situation of not being able to identify who prevails before whom. And that becomes very important. Are everyone pro rata? Or are every, everything is coterminous in terms of an exit? Or is there a seniority on the rights associated with the investment? All becomes very important uh, when you are looking at a documentation as such. Again, you know, some of these are hygiene things, but just as a matter of completion, you're looking at uh, Companies Act, Income Tax, SEBI, Competition Law, and uh, of course, FEMA. Uh, in nowadays, uh, none of the transactions uh, can be looked upon unless you have gone through FEMA provision. They may not apply, but important to apply uh, as a matter of fact, just to make sure that, uh, you know, these are compliant. And then uh, DPIIT, foreign direct investment policy, has to be looked upon. Like uh, we said uh, uh, in the beginning of the session, the, the recent change of uh, uh, FDI from uh, countries uh, touching India boundaries and so on and so forth, very, very important uh, to look at. Competition law, again, uh, to be looked upon. And then uh, specific laws that apply to the companies are also important to be looked upon because uh, you know if you if you are in a food business if you, if you are in a pharma business some of those uh, become important you are in a metal metallurgy business uh, all of them uh, become important and then uh, because of these laws obviously these uh, agencies come into play uh, IRDA for insurance company very important uh, pension fund regulatory uh, development authority and so on and so forth and you have uh, you know multiple of these agencies uh, and the regulatory bodies to be looked upon when you are looking at some of these uh, uh, situations uh, i'm going to skip uh, in the interest of time um, you know it's pretty obvious uh, on these governing provisions private placement further issue of shares preferential allotment consideration other than uh, uh, cash and so on and so forth. Uh, let me wait to see if there is any other question uh, from anyone. I don't see anything on chat, but anyone wants to ask uh, anything before I kind of uh, do my concluding uh, remarks. We have about uh, eight, 10 minutes left uh, for me to talk. Mehul, do you want to unmute everyone and see if anyone wants to ask questions direct 
uh, let me check. I have unmuted. I have asked everybody to unmute it. So if anybody wants to unmute, they can unmute and ask the question. Okay, any questions? Any, any thoughts, any, you know, if you have any, uh, any thoughts that you have uh, recently encountered uh, any situation that is interesting for uh, all of us to know happy to uh, happy to hear uh, your thoughts as well uh, yeah vivek uh, shridhar pathak here uh, as you rightly said that uh, you know we can do some sharing for the interest of the members uh, i had a situation where a client of mine had gone for funding obviously he was a great technical brain and he got investment from uk he had company in usa and while he was in India, uh, the UK investors uh, resorted to uh, some of the stringent provisions of the shareholder agreement, which he had signed on the dotted line without a proper legal counsel, even though he was in US. So, you know, uh, very smart people, technically competent people also make those kind of mistakes. And for the benefit of audience, I could tell, uh, uh, of course, without naming, that one of the stringent conditions was that if the cash flow from sales drops down a particular percentage from quarter on quarter, then the board of directors had the power uh, to first caution uh, the managing director and then to remove him. And uh, there were cautionary emails, uh, cautionary notices, uh, which were perhaps not taken in the right spirit. And uh, the gentleman got removed from the board of directors of the company of which he was a founder. He was the technical brain. And finally, he had to lose the control of the company. So, Vivek, so much is the importance of what you've told us for the last two, two hours. No, absolutely. I think uh, one of the, uh, uh, say, even from a tax perspective, people take such an aggressive stance. Uh, for example, we don't advise on tax, and we are very clear that you must have someone to advise you on tax. And we do continue to see a lot of aggressive stance saying that, you know, they claim it. Uh, and, I think that's where uh, the ecosystem has to uh, change, where people uh, look at some of this not as a cost, but uh, again, as an investment for protecting themselves. And remember, many a times, investors have all this protection. The people who are most vulnerable are uh, the founders and the company, and they end up on a you know losing streak because the investor, end of the day, are... Uh, are fairly protected uh, because of the obvious reasons. Yeah, uh, true, Vivek. And perhaps uh, uh, in the excitement of getting the funding, uh, some of the basics are overlooked. Yes, yes. I mean, that, that doesn't require any legal training, legal knowledge. <laughs> it's a fund fundamental human principle that you have to protect your future because you have built a company from an idea and you want to take it beyond and you are resorting to funding. It doesn't mean you don't take basic precautions. That's correct. And the other uh, aspect is who's your investor also makes a lot of difference. The early stage investment uh, euphoria of someone uh, who's, you know, non-related and non-aligned with your business is again a bigger challenge because they don't understand and appreciate the nuances of your business. And that might just lead to some frictions which are uh, obvious to happen because of non-alignment of thought process. Someone who's into SaaS business or someone who's you know, building a real long-term technology play and someone who's used to collecting cash end of the day, every day, and he's deploying his excess cash will never be able to apply uh, his mind and appreciate why it would take uh, you know, at least three years to generate uh, first cash flow in the business. But... Uh, money is money and the investment comes in, the rest is, uh, <laughs> uh, as they say, is history. So I think uh, as, I, as, as I conclude, the most important thing to look at both from an investor and investee, uh, otherwise they lose out, is to address the objective of what we are trying to do and what the company is trying to do and what the investor is trying to do. 
and uh, not to let go of the diligence uh, process uh, uh, because that's where you discover the right or wrong things and create a clear mechanism to address the governance issues and you know put in the MIS in place after the investment is gotten to protect both the company to go down because they are not tracked and not measured and the investment to go kaput because uh, you know they are not tracked at the investor end and the right set of uh, investment by the investor in their back end system uh, just as a mere fact that every month or every quarter an unaudited report will come in sets the uh, clear uh, governance process a compliance certificate by a managing director that everything is complied at least quarterly uh, or if not quarterly once in six months is a must and you know there is a cost to it but there is a cost of protecting remember that when you invest in a mutual fund there's a two percent uh two and a half percent depending on what you are doing a fee that fee is for all of this uh, governance mechanism uh, and that's what uh, we as professionals uh, need to educate uh, both sides and that helps uh, in the ecosystem as such and uh, you know the the regulatory environment has to be studied no doubt about that the changes are far too many and we don't take uh, things unless we have seen the latest and that's exactly how it needs to be while you're building the document, even before the document is signed, not just at the time of term sheet, but if two months have passed, it's important to test the regulations before you uh, sign up. And uh, as I keep telling everyone that a good document can never be a substitute for a bad partner, and then um, everything is negotiable, and it's about your leverage, and it's about uh, how you... Uh, position yourself is all uh, that matters in uh, you know the host of uh, things that's what i wanted to uh, present